Tonight, Alec Baldwin now facing possible jail time after a deadly shooting on his movie set. He was the actor that pulled the trigger. What we know about the new charges he faces in a case that's already changing how movies are made. Marketplace goes undercover in Mexico to find a Canadian pitching miracle cures with big price tags. We can shut cancer down in one treatment. We track him down back in Canada. What do you say to those people who've died after spending thousands of dollars, sir? A rotting mess inside an abandoned factory has a small town begging for help. We can't even open our windows. It's bad, really bad. Now a CBC News investigation reveals what's inside could be dangerous. This is, this is not right. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Alec Baldwin will be charged with involuntary manslaughter and faces the possibility of jail more than a year after a deadly shooting on a film set that left the cast reeling and the entire movie industry shocked. Baldwin was rehearsing on set in New Mexico back in 2021 when a prop gun he was holding went off. Cinematographer Helena Hutchins was shot and killed. Now, 15 months later, prosecutors say they're ready to charge Baldwin and he's not the only one. Thomas Degla takes us through what we know tonight and how this case is driving changes in the film industry. Alec Baldwin was the actor on set that pulled the trigger. Alec Baldwin? Yes, sir. Where's he at? In the frantic moments after the film set shooting, here's how Alec Baldwin described his involvement. Well, you were in the room when the lady when someone I was, was shot? holding the gun, yeah. Okay. But now prosecutors are laying out a more damning version of events. He was the actor that pulled the trigger, so certainly he's, he's charged as an actor. But also as a producer, he also had a duty to make sure that the, sa the set was safe. Both Baldwin and weapons supervisor Hannah Gutierrez-Reed are being charged with involuntary manslaughter, all stemming from the death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. The charges suggest prosecutors have evidence the shooting on that New Mexico ranch was an accident and the result of negligence. Involuntary manslaughter is like making a mistake. It's not intentional, but it's still serious because it's still an act of killing. Investigators found a real revolver on set and what appeared to be live rounds. Baldwin's lawyer called the manslaughter charges a terrible miscarriage of justice, adding Baldwin had no reason to believe there was a live bullet in the gun. The first uh, rule of gun safety is to treat every gun as, as loaded and do not point any firearm. While gunfire remains a familiar sight on screen, the movie set tragedy has pushed the industry to consider alternatives to real weapons, says this longtime prop master. It's more common than people think, uh, but we are seeing now where we're, they're being written out of scripts. We're using a lot of C, a lot more CGI gunfire now. The family of the victim, Helena Hutchins, says it is a comfort that in New Mexico, no one is above the law. We support the charges. If convicted, the two accused could each face five years behind bars. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. We have two exclusive investigations for you tonight, starting with a Canadian man who calls himself a doctor and claims he can heal a variety of illnesses with expensive treatments and devices, but many of his former followers say he misled them. David Common and Marketplace tracked him down in Mexico, where he's still seeing patients. Hey, gotta stop squirming. Gotta stop squirming. Inside a tent at a budget resort in Mexico, this is touted as treatment on a healing fracture. Oh, I don't know if I can do any more. This is breaking. Treatment targeting the desperate, often with a big price tag. Look at that. Crap, crap. Look at this now. The Canadian running this operation is Daryl Wolf, who claims cures for just about anything. We can shut cancer down in one treatment. It's not the first time he's made bold claims. All my clients have HIV. In 1994, we busted him for selling a fake AIDS cure. Hi, Mr. Wolf. Though he claimed he wasn't, he shut down the clinic and later moved his operation to Mexico, where hundreds traveled to meet him in the hopes of being saved. What did he promise you about Mexico? He said that he had 
worked with this. He's worked with, with breast cancer. Nancy Jacobs wanted alternative treatment. She says she spent $13,000 with Wolf. It didn't help. Total regret ever going there. How could I be so foolish? Nancy Jacobs died shortly after this interview. Mr. Wolf, David Common with CBC Marketplace. How are you today? We caught up with Daryl Wolf when he you, returned to Canada. Oh, there are uh, many claims that you've made about being able to cure cancer and a number of other. Shows. We've recorded you. We've recorded you doing that. What do you say to those people who've died after spending thousands of dollars, sir? There is nobody that has with us. After our investigation, YouTube removed many of Wolf's videos. Facebook launched a review. But he continues to operate in Mexico, drawing in clients and dollars. So David, with all this evidence, why does Wolf have so many followers and is, is anything happening to try to stop them? Yeah, I mean, all good questions, but on the followers, I think when you are desperate for something to be true, it becomes true in your mind, uh, particularly if you are especially vulnerable, if you have a, a lethal diagnosis. There's also a great deal of misinformation that's out there. He builds on that. He has been cited for it. Facebook once again saying, they're going to put a review on because of this. But as long as that keeps churning, he will continue to have followers, and those followers will continue to generate money for him. David, thank you for doing this. Thank you. You can watch David's full investigation tomorrow on Marketplace. That's at 8 p.m. on CBC Television, 8.30 in Newfoundland, or you can stream it on CBC Gem. Now to renewed calls for help in a Newfoundland town to clean up an abandoned fish sauce plant. Here's why. You're looking at cell phone video inside of the building. The structure itself is deteriorating. Many ingredients have been left to rot for decades, at one point seeping into the ocean. But the site isn't just an eyesore, it stinks. Tonight, Rob Antle uncovers new information sparking new concern. A breathtaking view that can take your breath away, quite literally. We can't even open our windows. It's bad, really bad. The smell is just unbearable. This plant used to manufacture fish sauce. It hasn't operated in about 20 years, but vats of the sauce have been fermenting ever since, enveloping parts of the community in a foul odor. Perhaps worse than the smell lingering around town are the unanswered questions lingering too. Because we don't know what we're dealing with. We've uncovered some old testing results that have sparked some new concerns about what's inside the abandoned plant behind me. Four years ago, the CBC filed an access to information request. Now some answers, and we're showing the town's mayor what we've learned. Why don't you get to have a look at that? After reports of effluent flowing into the ocean in 2016, the Federal Environment that? Department swooped in. They found that when fish were exposed to the substance, it killed them within 15 minutes, described as acutely lethal. All this is news to the mayor. It never came to the town to let us know how toxic this really is to fish and, and the environment. Like, this is, this is not right. That leak was fixed, but news of the test results has renewed concern. Well, if it's killing fish, what's it, what's it doing to the people that's living here? You know, something got to be done, my God. Environment Canada says its responsibility was to protect the fish, which it did when the pipe was sealed. It steered questions about health and odor to the province, who confirmed the town did put in a funding request for cleanup, but that request did not meet the necessary criteria. It adds the plant owner is responsible for cleanup. But the company dissolved 17 years ago, and the owner hasn't been heard from in years. The mayor says it's time for action. We know what's here now. Let's just go and clean it up. All levels of government. Let's work together and get this, get this done. Once and for all. He says that's something the town of 309 people can't do on its own. So, Rob, clearly this community is concerned and the mayor is asking for help. We put this right to the premier today. What did he say? Well, he didn't provide any concrete solutions, but he is committing to at least look for solutions going forward. Well, first of all, let me sympathize with the residents who are impacted by the issue. Uh, we're certainly willing to sit down with all different levels of government and agencies. As you know, it's not straightforward. It's, it's quite complex uh, to seek resolutions. 
Now, as for the federal government, the local Liberal MP says he's going to bring all this up with the Environment Minister. In the meantime, there's a meeting scheduled in St. Mary's tomorrow. The mayor expects basically the entire community is going to be there. All right, Rob Anton, St. John's. Thank you, Rob. Police in Quebec have now identified three people killed after an explosion at a propane distributor last week. 26-year-old Christophe Paradis was a subcontractor at the company in the town of saint roch de lachigan Two 65-year-old employees were also killed, Céline Pion and France Desrosiers. Police announced Monday they recovered all three bodies. The cause of that explosion is still under investigation. The family of a man allegedly swarmed and killed by a group of teenage girls in Toronto last month is speaking out. In a statement, Ken Lee's loved ones called him a kind soul with a heart of gold. Regarding his alleged attackers who cannot be named under the Youth Criminal Justice Act, these perpetrators should not have any privacy rights or bail. The public should be aware of who these individuals are to protect themselves. The girls accused in Lee's death are all between the ages of 13 and 60. Ottawa has agreed to bring a group of 19 women and children to Canada from detention camps in Syria. The camps are for suspected ISIS militants and their family members. As Ashley Burke explains, the agreement to repatriate such a large group is a major shift in policy. It's a place the government didn't want to go. Ottawa long argued these detention camps in northeastern Syria for ISIS suspects and their families were too dangerous and diplomats couldn't go to bring Canadians back. Now that's changed. I think this is long past due. Um, definitely the right choice. This national security law expert who's interviewed detained Canadians in Syria thinks Canada was forced to finally act. There was significant pressure from the international community, um, UN and human rights organizations um, on Canada and other countries, especially the United States, had been really pressuring its allies to start returning its, um, its citizens. Global Affairs Canada has now agreed to return 13 Canadian children and six women. They were part of a group who took their case to federal court. Their lawyer had argued they were living in deplorable, unsafe conditions. They are uh, understandably very, very happy to uh, have a, a light at the end of the tunnel. Before a judge could issue a decision in that case, this new deal came out. But it doesn't include everyone. It leaves out four Canadian men. One of those men is Jack Letts. He's accused of joining ISIS and has been in detention for more than five years. There was nothing presented in the record in federal court that showed that the men were more dangerous than the women, nothing at all. The concern from critics of the deal is that those brought back could evade justice. If they are tried here in Canada, are we gonna bring the witnesses over from Kurdistan? Are we gonna bring the evidence over here? And I think these, these trials are gonna fail. Two women who Canada did repatriate last year were arrested after their plane touched down on Canadian soil. One released on a peace bond, the other facing terrorism-related offences. The lawyer representing the women who are coming home next says that he doesn't know what could happen and if any will face charges. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Tonight marks one year since a tragedy along the Canada-U.S. border in Manitoba. A family of four trying to cross illegally, was found frozen to death. As Karen Pauls tells us now, while police in India have laid charges, police here are still looking for answers. Here's the border right here. It probably would have been, yeah, just over right, right in this area here. Sheriff Matthew Vig points to where his officers caught seven people after they walked illegally over the Canada-U.S. border one year ago. It's urgent because we know a person's not going to survive too long out there in the cold. So we try to, you know, get there as soon as we can. Not far away in a snow-covered Manitoba field, RCMP discovered the frozen bodies of a couple from India and their two young children. U.S. officials have charged a Florida man with human smuggling. This week, police in India laid charges against two men believed to have helped the family get to Canada. But RCMP officers still don't know who met the Patels once they landed at Toronto's Pearson Airport and how they got to the Manitoba border. They travelled 2,000 kilometres uh, within Canada and uh, just hoping that people will come forward because we know someone facilitated them, someone saw them, they stayed somewhere. 
Now, a few new details about the timeline and a plea for tips. January 14th to the 16th, 2022, they were staying in the Mississauga area and the city of Welland, Ontario. You know, sometimes when you talk about this, your hearts are pumping. The deaths continue to haunt people in Winnipeg's Gujarati community who jumped in to translate and plan the Patel family's funeral. People are still can't understand, you know, how it happened. You know, it was like, see, even in this cold weather, we don't like to stay outside. How can you tell someone to go 30 below in extreme wind chill weather? The RCMP say they believe the Patel's deadly journey was a thought out and organized operation, likely run by a human smuggling network. Their relatives in India tell us they're still in mourning and haunted by their losses. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. In France, unions are promising another nationwide strike after more than a million people took to the streets today. They're upset about plans to raise the age of retirement. But as Abby Kuathasen shows us, they're not the only ones digging in tonight. A sea of demonstrators in Paris met by a cloud of tear gas from police. Hundreds of thousands of public sector workers walked off the job nationwide to protest the government's proposed pension reforms. This student says young people like her will be the first to feel the impact because there will be less opportunities if older workers stay in their jobs longer. The strikes brought France to a near standstill. Trucks were backed up in the north as the ferry crossing to Britain was closed and severe travel disruptions too. In Paris, almost no local or regional trains were running at all. Il faut procéder à cette réforme. Still, French President Emmanuel Macron insists today this reform needs to be carried out. The proposed bill would push the retirement age from 62 to 64, but it would also speed up another amendment. Only those who've worked at least 43 years will be able to collect a full pension. That would leave some parents who took time to raise their children ineligible. The public pension system is uh, regularly in deficit. Uh, starting next year, it should be around 10 billions of euro per year. The government says this is unsustainable because soon there won't be enough people working to support retirees. But the unions argue the government has other options. They call for taxing the super rich or asking employers to ramp up contributions. Pour nous, he says their goal is to see the reform bill withdrawn. The French government is promising to minimize pain by raising the minimum pension and making it easier for people with physically demanding jobs to retire earlier. But that hasn't stopped the widespread protests, and the unions say this is just the beginning. Abby Kouadas in CBC News, London. Some sad news from the music world tonight. Legendary musician David Crosby has passed away. I am yours, you are mine. You are what you are. The singer-songwriter's storied career and his influence on rock. Provinces are coming up with their own solutions for an ailing healthcare system. We need to be bold. We need to be innovative. Could this put Ottawa's funding at risk? Rosie's here with that issue. And the moment a transit worker springs to action to save a talk. I uh, recognize that uh, the child is in distress. We are back in two. Away from the front lines in Ukraine, another fierce battle is raging. Crews are tire tirelessly stitching a shattered electrical grid back together, even as Russia continues to blast it apart. And Chris Brown shows us in that fight, Ukraine now has a chance to turn the tide. Ukrainians in darkened cities such as Chernihiv now spend their nights living by flashlight. The Russian barrage of attacks on Ukraine's energy grid have put repair crews on a different kind of front line, trying to repel the enemy's efforts to freeze Ukrainians into submission. The Russians are bombarding us, said Zer Kudashev. We have to do the repairs to protect people. Since October, Russia's missile onslaught has incapacitated 50% of Ukraine's system, from generating stations to substations to the transmission lines. International help has been pouring in. 
This lighting tower is one of 50 donated by the Canada-Ukraine Foundation, which is coordinating a lot of the aid for Ukraine. It's to ensure the difficult job of repairing Ukraine's battered electrical system continues day and night. The old portable lights we had weren't good enough, said Supervisor Alexander Korup. Intense repairs require sturdy lighting towers. People here have already endured a lot. Last March, Russian forces made it to the outskirts of Chernihiv, which is only 50 kilometers from Belarus. Battle damage means a pedestrian bridge is the only way for many to get to their homes. It's difficult to cook food or to stay warm at home. There's no stability. It's very bad, she said. Some days it's massive attacks. Uh, what do we mean by massive? It's from 70 to 100 missiles at once. Ukraine's energy minister told us restoring the grid will take months, but a bolstered air defense system is helping repair crews catch up. We see that the level of, of these uh, drones and missiles, which was hit by, by our air defense system, has increased dramatically. Ukrainians have managed to beat back the cold and the darkness, but winter is only halfway done and the Russian missiles keep coming. Chris Brown, CBC News, Chernihiv. Washington announced another $2.5 billion in military gear for Ukraine, including armored vehicles. Combined with announcements today from the European allies, Ukraine is gaining a lot of advanced mobility, protection and firepower for its troops. That aid to Ukraine is just part of the U.S. government spending at the heart of a new political fight since the country hit its debt ceiling. Raising the borrowing limit needs bipartisan support. Cam McIntosh shows us the dispute threatening global financial stability. Think of it like the U.S. government increasing the limit on its credit card to pay bills coming due. Republican leader is saying... That's what President Joe Biden wants, warning if House Republicans don't go along. They're going to shut down the government by not providing the votes to pay our federal debt. But Republicans want future spending cuts before agreeing. Who wants to put the nation in some type of threat at the last minute of debt ceiling? Nobody wants to do that. That's why we're asking, let's, let's change our behavior now. Now sitting at $31.4 trillion, with a T, the U.S. debt ceiling intended to limit government borrowing has become more of a political lever, raised 78 times since the 60s. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says it must rise again or the U.S. risks default later this year. It's not dangerous at all, so long as we resolve this in the next few months. But, says this economist, if it drags to a default, it would unleash a financial chain reaction. Services cut, employees unpaid, and critically, a Treasury no longer able to pay interest on U.S. bonds. If suddenly it's not a safe asset, that probably means almost every major country is going to have a recession. We uh, continue to watch... That has the Prime Minister watching. States, but we're going to make sure uh, that Canadians continue uh, to succeed regardless of what happens down there. In Washington, politics will have to play out first. New GOP House Speaker Kevin McCarthy has little leeway with Republicans demanding cuts loudly on Fox News. If you're going to have a party, you have to pay the band. If you're going to borrow money, you have to pay it back. As and the White House done, insists, bills must be paid. It should not be used as a political football. Tense, but the U.S. has been here many times before. I think the saying is Americans always do the right thing when they run out of all the other options. It's just the faith in and the credit of the country at stake with no quick resolution in sight, at least not until both the money and the pressure get tighter. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Washington. A legendary American singer-songwriter, a giant of the Woodstock generation, has died. David Crosby worked with some of rock's biggest names. Above our nation, we are stardust. Crosby first rose to fame over six decades ago with folk rock band The Birds. Before joining the group, he'd become most famous for. Certain to tell you. Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young became one of the most influential bands of its generation, though internal tensions led them to break up several times over the years. Through it all, Crosby kept playing, writing, and touring, sometimes with his bandmates, sometimes on his own. 
a prolific musician, David Crosby released dozens of albums over those six decades. His wife confirmed his death after a long illness to Variety magazine, saying his legacy will continue to live on through his legendary music. And after the break, Rosie's here with that issue. Hey, Rosie. Hi, Adrian. Tonight we're going to talk about that health care deal between Ottawa and the provinces, the one yet to come, and why some provinces are moving ahead with their own solutions. The status quo is no longer acceptable. We need to be bold. We need to be innovative. We need to be creative. So how creative should provinces be and will more money fix the problem? Chantal, Althea, Andrew and Emily Nicola will join me to talk about that and Hi there, I'm Rosemary Barton. Here's what's at issue this week. The Prime Minister says he hopes there will be good news on the health care front soon, saying Ottawa and the provinces are all very much on the same page. There is a need for more money. There is a need uh, for more delivery of results uh, for families. Meanwhile, provinces are coming up with their own solutions. Ontario announced it will expand the number of surgeries in for-profit clinics. The status quo is no longer acceptable. We need to be bold. We need to be innovative. We need to be creative. So is more money from Ottawa the solution, part of the solution? Should provinces be willing to use private facilities to help alleviate the strain? Let's bring in our panelists, Chantal Bear, Andrew Coyne, uh, Althea Raj, and joining us this week, Emily Nicolas from Le Devoir. Good to see everybody. Appreciate you being here. Um, I think there's two things going on this week. There's the Ontario uh, announcement around use of uh, for pro uh, for-profit clinics, and then there's the idea that a healthcare deal um, seems to be possible now. So, um, mm -hmm. Andrew, I'll, I'll throw it to you first and see where you want to start, uh, maybe on, on the Ontario aspect and whether that seems like a, a reasonable solution or, or not. I think it's a reasonable solution. It's a limited and imperfect solution, but I think it's part of uh, a broader agenda of reform that has to happen, and it's encouraging to see people at least broaching this subject. You know, there are legitimate concerns and illegitimate concerns. If it's just a knee-jerk reaction to, oh, a private clinic for-profit, um, I think people need to get over themselves. Doctors are private for-profit businesses already. They don't seem to have uh, destroyed the system from, from their involvement. Um, there are concerns, I think, that are more legitimate to do with will these clinics be able to attach uh, or to offer other services that do charge a fee, and if they do, does that become a kind of disguised user fee if they make them conditional, you know, conditional on, on access that they have to order these services? That's a legitimate concern to look after. I think it's, you know, at least plausible to ask about the, the um, um, diversion of staff question, although right. if they're providing service for free to the public, I'm not sure I'm that exercised about that. It's just moving from one section of the healthcare system to another. So there are these things, these questions that are worth asking. None of them sound to me like the kinds of risks that can't be mitigated, can't be guarded against. Uh, and certainly, uh, the last question I want to ask is, is this just simply adding resources to the system? In other words, how are these going to be allocated? On what basis do these private clinics get this business? Or is there some provision going to be built in where they're competing with the public uh, right. hospitals? Right. What we really need is, is not so much more money going to the system, although maybe that's uh, useful at this time, but getting more bang for the buck from the, ones we are, the dollars we are spending. And competition has to be part of that. And, and certainly provinces are all looking at all kinds of different solutions. We saw some announcements from Nova Scotia this week to deal with its ER. But, but uh, I mean, are, is the money factor the, the big missing piece there, Chantal? Or, or do all these things ha sort of have to be on the table at the same time? Well, money alone isn't going to resolve the, the so-called health care crisis. So you can, uh, we have been throwing money at the system for more than a decade. And here we are talking about worse uh, shortages and worse wait times than uh, we did when uh, more money was put in the system. So clearly, uh, uh, and without thinking that uh, Doug Ford has landed the magic recipe, clearly mm -hmm. a lot more changes are going to be happening and provinces will be experimenting with a variety of, of options. And I think on that front, uh, the time is ripe. As for private, you know, pharmacists are doing more and more of the uh, handing out prescriptions for a variety of, of issues where you would have to go to a doctor in the past. Pharmacists, last time I checked, do not work as public service employees. 
they, yeah. they run for-profit uh, pharmacies. So somewhere, somehow, there, this will be experimented. I'm guessing the proof will be in the pudding. Will mm -hmm. it make the situation better, the system more efficient? Will people get care in a timely fashion? Those questions uh, cannot be answered without some attempt at uh, doing things differently than the things that haven't worked over the past two decades. Althea. Um, so I think my colleagues have done a good job of laying out the problem. I will say I think there are legitimate concerns to be voiced in the sense that you don't um, create nurses and doctors out of thin air, especially yeah. nurses. And there are legitimate concerns about if you um, start operating for private uh, surgeries that you know might pay nurses more are they more likely to leave the public system and then are you leaving the public system that is an alert even more an alert and what does that mean for more complicated surgeries mm -hmm. for emergency room wait times etc cetera, etc cetera. but to bring it back to the politics of it the one thing that i thought was really striking this week was how the prime minister was incredibly muted in his criticism of the deal this is a leader that has fancied himself to be pretty much on uh, the center left of the political spectrum. And here is an issue that speaks to a lot of progressive Canadians about you know, th their core identity as a Canadian wrapped around uh, public health care. And the prime minister uses the words like innovation. He yeah. um, described that as Doug Ford is innovating in an interview with my colleague Susan Delacourt. Um, that, you know, he could have e just said nothing. He could have said, oh, well, I think there are concerns to be raised about this or I'm waiting to see something mm -hmm. along these lines. He said nothing. And as far as I'm told, it has nothing to do with the negotiations with the premiers. This is the prime minister himself choosing not to wade into that. And this is a giant opportunity for Jagmeet Singh, who has been dying to try to find a way to distinguish himself from the Liberal leader, finally, Mr. Singh has an issue that clearly shows a divide between the NDP and the Liberal Party. Emily? It's interesting we're talking about, you know, is this the right solution for, for the problem? And we all have our, our perspective of what the problem, in, but the problem is, but we haven't had a, a, a conversation, a space to actually take a step back from the pandemic and be looking at you know what the problem actually is in our in our in our healthcare system. There, uh, the the conservative uh, position in Ottawa have called in the past for an inquiry into you know the pandemic and what happened then. There's been that as well in Ontario. But what what happens now is that we we haven't had a, a step back from the the crisis mode of managing the the pandemic. And as as a result of that, we see the system the the healthcare system crumbling in Ontario and other parts of the country as well. Um, we're having this conversation through the negotiation of the health transfers. We're having this conversation through some premiers, including the Ontario Premier, but also other premiers, uh, announcing more space for the private sector. But the, 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 there, there hasn't been a space, a formal space, for example, for experts to weigh in and see this is where we should be taking uh, our, 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 our public health care uh, systems uh, across Canada. We haven't had a space, except for journalists, you know, reaching out to doctors and, yeah. and doctors then giving interviews in terms of what's the problem on the ground. There hasn't been also a lot of space for people beyond doctors yeah. who are in the healthcare system to formally be able to say this is our experience, this is what we think the problem is. And then we're already into solution modes and we, yeah. we think that the solution mode is, is private. So I think there needs to be a, 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 step, a step taken back. I'm not saying it's likely going to happen yeah. soon, yeah. but I'm saying yeah. that's, seem, that's this, the, the piece that seems to be missing from this conversation. Chantal and Andrew, yeah. Except that. Uh, I could point my finger if I kept all those reports to an entire bookshelf of reports mm -hmm. yes. uh, that uh, identify the issues that are today the problem. Uh, uh, these are not new problems. Way back when uh, Paul Martin negotiated uh, the 10-year accord uh, in 2004, not enough home care, which is crowding the public system that should be used for other purposes. There's a long list. Mm -hmm. And you can find a solution that suits you going through this because it covers the full range of what people could do, including more pri private input. Yeah. So uh, I would caution, having lived through that era, <laughs> that again appointing some commission somewhere in some provinces and federally takes two or three years, which by then will add more books to that shelf that I keep at home. 
but but the other thing that that uh, uh, the prime minister said in, in that interview uh, with, with Susan Delacourt, Althea, and I'll get you to weigh in on this, Andrew, is that he he's happy to see 13 provinces and territories try different things yes. to quote unquote innovate. It, like he wants them to try and experiment to fix things, as though this is going to play out in real time. These solutions. It's a marked difference from the tone the prime minister took as recently as the last election, when, if you'll recall, he did campaign quite shamelessly against any suggestion of. Uh, private involvement in the system. So it's welcome to see that that changing. It's, I think that's a partly a reflection that this is where the center of gravity of public opinion, I think, is now. People are perhaps ahead of the political class to that extent. Nobody wants to see, or not many people only want to, want to see user fees, uh, but private involvement in a publicly funded system strikes me as being perfectly reasonable. Uh, and I agree with Chantal, there has to be room for not just experimentation, but for failure, for making mistakes. Mm, yeah. Uh, 30 seconds to you, Althea. On the one hand, the Prime Minister has a fine line to walk because Quebec has private clinics, British Columbia has private clinics, like he can't come out full on assault. Mm -hmm. But he can raise concerns about the values that he has spent the last election campaigns espousing. And I guess that was my original right. point. It is really noteworthy that he chose not to go there. Okay, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back with another round of At Issue. Pierre Poiliev is touring Quebec after recent polls showed support for the conservative leader is lacking. Will it work, this tour? That's next on The National. Welcome to another round of At Issue. Conservative leader Pierre Poiliev is touring Quebec. <laughs> Conservative leader is doing what others before him have tried to do, win over a battleground province that could determine the next election. Quelle est votre optique pour euh, séduire les Québécois? Mais je respecte l'autonomie du Québec. His message, he respects Quebec's autonomy, but also thinks Quebecers care about the same things as everyone else, inflation and government spending. So what's to be made of Poiliev's tour of Quebec and will he be able to win over support in an area that has sometimes proven difficult uh, for conservatives? Let's bring everyone back. Chantal, Althea, Andrew and Emily Nicola. Chantal, I'm going to start with you and then Emily, you can jump in. Uh, Chantal, is this, um, is this a lost endeavor from the get-go? Is there hope here for the conservatives and Mr. Poiliev? Well, uh, he, he didn't take off uh, in a positive manner in Quebec after the leadership campaign uh, and the numbers uh, speak to that. This, this is the province where uh, people, the, the most people have a poor impression of Pierre Poiliev uh, and uh, are, it shows in the, the, the voting intentions. In some polls the Conservatives are down to 17 percent. In other polls they're around their usual score. To put it bluntly, non-Quebec leaders have tended to do poorly in Quebec. None, no non-Quebec leader has ever won Quebec except for Jack Layton. And Jack Layton did something uh, that Pierre Poiliev would need to do, i.e. he found Thomas Mulcair. <laughs> and, and that gave his party more credibility. Suddenly people gave him a second look mm. because he'd found someone who people considered a, a, a solid politician from Quebec uh, to give his party an identity. But if Pierre Poiliev is counting on just himself and his rhetoric, I think against uh, Yves-François Blanchet and Justin Trudeau, because remember, Justin Trudeau is a Quebec leader mm -hmm. who is facing off against the conservative leader who, on his way to his position, walked all over Jean Charest, a former Quebec premier, yeah. and yeah. lost his most likable Quebec lieutenant, Alain Reyes. So in this province, that's who Pierre Poiliev is, the guy who uh, doesn't like uh, Quebec political talent. Emily? Um, Pierre Poiliev is not very well known here yet. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of people, of course, in the rest of the country who's been following his career at the House of Commons for, for, for years, and, but the, the coverage of the, national, the, the House of Commons in Quebec in, in general tends to be um, not take as, as much space. And so uh, the first impression we had, the, one of the first times that he, he made really the headlines here, as Chantal was just mentioning, was for uh, the, those robocalls essentially he made to some of the constituents in the riding of Alain Reyes. Mm -hmm. And so um, that story was basically how he entered everyone's uh, imagination. Uh, however, uh, Yves-François Blanchet, who is the one person he would mostly be running against, but it's not like Blanchet has had an amazing year as well. Right. Uh, right. So that also factors in the, the potential that Pierre Poliev has for growth. Althea. 
I think it was Chantal's column pointed out that in yep. the Angus Reid survey, he's at 44% of Quebecers who have a very negative view of him. So his charm offensive, he's doing, you know, while he may not be doing it in the rest of the country, he was doing lots of local media, national media. He's trying to shape and change the image that people already have in their mind, as Emily was talking about. Um, it's interesting to note that he's meeting with, uh, round, that he met with roundtables of women, uh, women who suffered from domestic violence. He Pierre Poliev has a women problem. This is one way to approach it. Um, I thought it was really interesting in his conversation with um, Patrice Roy, the clip that you just um, aired, where he talked about, you know, respecting Quebec's autonomy. Mm -hmm. Because the mm -hmm. one thing that is going to cause him a bit of a pickle, frankly, and I'm sure the Bleu Québécois is going to be reminding uh, Quebecers of this, is Mr. Poliev um, has changed his tune on Bill 21, which is not... Um, Mr. Shear's position, it wasn't Mr. O'Toole's position, he supports or has said that he's not going to change the federal government's course if it decides to appeal uh, the law now to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, he seems to be walking that back a little, but in, on, on that question, on abortion, on climate change, these are all things where he is he and the people who support him, and that is key, the caucus that dumped O'Toole and decided to back Pierre Poiliev very much do not have values and uh, policies that align with the majority of Quebecers. So right. that will cause him a problem. Andrew? I agree that Mr. Poyev has a, very much an uphill climb in Quebec, partly for his own personal reasons, partly because of the stances his party has taken on things like guns or climate change. But let's get real. There's only been two conservative leaders since the 1890s that have carried Quebec. <laughs> uh, you know, so basically, if you're a conservative leader, you have two options. Uh, you can lose in Quebec, but preserve your dignity and your self-respect and some kind of coherent message for the country as a whole. Uh, or you can pander shamelessly to every Quebec nationalist uh, uh, wish list, uh, sell your soul, and still lose your deposit. Uh, the past couple of conservative leaders took option B. It may be that uh, Pierre Poilievre will take option A. I think he'd be better advised to do so. You, you, I think Stephen Harper showed you can win the country without winning a whole lot of seats in Quebec. Yep. Yep. The numbers didn't used to be there, but if you put together a majority in, in Ontario and the rest of the west of Canada, you can. Uh, and secondly, um, you don't need to win a lot of seats in Quebec. You just need to be respectable there to yep. get Ontario yep. to yep. Win, seats, yep. win, win seats in Ontario. And if you win enough seats in Ontario, Quebec will start to give you a look. Very quickly, Chantal. Except that uh, as opposed to Stephen Harper, Pierre Poiliev has an Ontario problem and it's called Doug Ford. By the time the next election comes around, chances are the Conservatives are not going to be very popular provincially. And ask Paul Martin how much it cost him when Dalton McGuinty was uh, imposing a health heavy and there was a federal campaign on. So yes, Andrew is totally right. But I'm not so sure that the prospects of a big win in Ontario are as great under a conservative government in Ontario as they were for Harper when the Liberals were in power mm -hmm. at Queen's Park. 20 seconds to you, Emily, and I gotta go. Uh, there's a lot of Ontarians who know Pierre Poliev already, and a lot of them have decided to dislike them, so changing that opinion is, is harder. It doesn't mean that it would be hard, that it would be easy for him to change their mind. It's just that it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's starting from more of a negative um, perception in Ontario than in Quebec, where okay. there's often no perception at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I gotta leave it there. Good conversation, everybody. I appreciate it. Now let me send things back to Adrian in Toronto. Thanks, Rosie. After the break, not all heroes wear capes. Bystanders were mentioning that a uh, child was choking. How this transit worker saved a toddler's life in our moment. The man in the middle there, Ben Curtin, is being hailed a hero today after he saved a child from choking. The Toronto Transit Supervisor was working an ordinary day when anything but began to unfold. And without hesitation, he sprang to action. His life-saving deed is our moment. I'm just glad I was there at the right place at the right time. As usual, I'm working my Coxwell shift here. The train pulls in, alarm activation on board the train. The scene was chaotic. There was a big commotion. With previous background as a paramedic and recent training with TTC, uh, first aid training, uh, I recognized that uh, the child was in distress, uh, more so respiratory distress. Also bystanders were mentioning that the uh, child was choking. I held the child and then performed first aid procedures, which included some backflows to help relieve the obstruction 
um, at that point, uh, some of the obstructions were free and the uh, child started breathing again. Uh, color was good. I, I'm proud. It's, it's, it's a good feeling. Just even today, being recognized by Rick Leary and the executives and the board was a good feeling. Yeah, I, I'm proud. I'm proud to have uh, been there at the right time, at the right place. And uh, the outcome was, was a positive. No kidding. Right time, right place, right man. What a moment. While we're talking moments, here's another one. A beautiful human being named Dave Berroubet, who is our floor director, is retiring today. It's his last day. He's standing right there, as he has been for more years, and he'd like me to tell you right now. Dave of the Golden Voice and the Big Heart, we will miss you. We thank you, my pal. That is a national for January the 19th. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.